Well, good morning. It's so good to see everyone here this morning. It was such a blessing to have uh, a classroom full of potential new members and uh, great time, great questions, and just, uh, just a delight to talk about the church and God's gift to us as his people to have each other. And uh, just some great things I remember about class and what I taught is that, hey, we are brothers and sisters in Christ forever. Amen. And so it's, uh, it's an eternal relationship that we get to have with each other that God has blessed us with. And so it's just so good, so good to see everyone here this morning. Hope you've had a good week. Uh, we, and for a real treat this morning, uh, let you know nothing's wrong with me. I'm not sick or anything like that, so you can still shake my hand. But Hayden's going to be preaching for us this morning <clears throat> as I lose my voice. <laughs> and... Uh, but this is, to, uh, this is for many different reasons. Hayden is a gift to the church. Yes. He is a wonderful pastor. He will do an excellent job. He, has, he is growing, and hopefully I am still growing as well. And so I just don't want you to think anything's wrong uh, with Hayden preaching. We want to, to work this into the life of the church so that I don't ever become a statistic of burnout. And so you may have seen that with pastors. I don't want to ever burn out. I, want to, I hope to be like P.J. Scott, Pastor that was in Olive Branch and, and had an influence in my life. He preached on Sunday and died on a Friday. And I hope to do the same. And so this is to help prevent that as well. But uh, I just want to say I'm so thankful for my brother. Uh, uh, he, does, he, is a, he is a brother. He is a co-worker. But I would say the main thing, is he is a friend. Amen. And, uh, and that's, that's, the, that's the blessing of ministry is to have friends in ministry. Amen. And so let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for... Your goodness and your mercy that is so rich in our lives, Lord, we would, we would have never chosen you, God. We would, have, uh, we would have kept running the opposite way if it wasn't for you. You came after us. God, we thank you so much that you revealed yourself to us. God, that you showed us the glory of, of the kindness of your grace and mercy and your deep love for us. And Father, I pray that you would show that to someone afresh and anew today in this room. Someone that, that does not yet know you, Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, that you would draw them with your powerful, powerful right arm that is mighty to save. God, we trust in you, Lord. We pray that this day will be about Jesus. Mm. And Father, that we would worship you and glorify your name. God, we would see you in your beauty and your majesty. God, recognize you at your throne. And God, we would just delight in you, Lord. God, that we would uh, look forward to the day when we are complete and whole in Christ, and there is no longer any sin, any temptation to pull us away from, from knowing exactly what we should know about Christ. God, help us to, Lord, to sing songs of praise and adoration uh, and sing it as unto you, Lord. God, we thank you. Your word tells us that you inhabit the praises of your people. And Lord, we just declare that you are worthy of every song, every praise. And God, we just give this hour, this, this time to you, would you magnify yourself? In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, speaking of Christ, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we sing Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever. Yes. 
blessed Redeemer. I think of Him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I know, I know I shall see in His view. my footsteps and give it me songs sing redeemed 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 by the blood of the lamb redeemed redeemed is child and forever I am we sing redeemed Praise the Lord, he has redeemed us. be seated. 
As we continue uh, through this time of worship, we're going to take this opportunity to go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us in our worship today. Ask him to help us uh, keep our, our thoughts, our, our affections, and our desires fixed upon his son Christ. So if you would please go to the Lord uh, in prayer and ask him to help you in your worship today. Continuing through to Psalm chapter 6. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? For I am, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My, eyes waste, wastes, my eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all of my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All of my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together to worship. Brother and sister is the family of God. Lord, help us as we experience suffering and trial as we battle with temptation, as we wrestle with grief, help us to remember that Christ and Christ alone is our only hope and comfort in life and in death. Help us to remember your steadfast love for us through every trial and temptation. Father, we ask that you help us as we continue to worship. We ask these things in the name of your most holy and precious Son, Christ, and through his blood. Amen. Would you please stand with us? We sing, Where is my hope? Where is my hope when the oceans roar, cast away and far from shore? My shepherd, my shepherd is with me through raging squalls. Jesus Christ, Lord of all. my help when temptation swarms. Strength is weak and I am worn. He is my refuge for I am small. Jesus Christ, Lord of all. We sing Christ alone. Christ alone. Comfort in life, Christ alone, my comfort in death. Look to Christ, my weary soul, and sing, Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Yes. my comfort when sorrows rise 
and endless tears fill my eyes. There is but one name that I can call. Oh, yes, there is. Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Christ alone, my comfort in life. Christ alone, my comfort in death. Look to Christ, my weak soul, and sing. Christ, Lord of all. There at the end of my life. There at the end of my life. Oh, death, now thy sting. For he has redeemed. For he has redeemed me from Adam's fall. Jesus. Jesus Christ, Lord of all, Christ alone, Christ alone, my comfort in light, Christ alone, my comfort in death, look to Christ, my weary soul, and see. Christ, Lord of all. We sing Christ alone. Christ alone, my comfort in life. Christ alone, my comfort in death. Look to Christ, my weary soul, and see. Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Amen. You all sound so beautiful. Amen. Consumes like fire. What other glory consumes like fire? What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy
Who else could rescue me from my failing? could rescue me. Amen. No, amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Father, truly, who else could rescue us from our failing? And more than that, Father, who else would offer his only son? Father, what a marvelous mystery that though we were once your enemies, you have invited us to call you our Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for the gospel. <laughs> Father, as we continue in our worship today, as Hayden steps up to preach your word, help him to preach your word boldly and faithfully. And Father, by your Spirit, move in all of our hearts and our minds that we may understand your word rightly. Father, may Christ and in Christ alone receive all of the honor, the glory, and the praise, for he is worthy of it all. It's in his name and through his blood, all of God's people pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, that is our prayer for every Sunday and every day, that as we gather here, we would come and worship the Holy God. And I pray that we do so this morning, through the reading and preaching of His Word. This morning, we're going to be continuing our walk through the book of Romans. We'll be in Romans 1, verses 18 through 23. And I've really enjoyed our first few weeks. Danny has done such a great job leading us through verse by verse. What, what are these first 17 verses saying and how does it relate to the rest of, this, of, of the book of Romans? And, and we've talked about how, how, how great and glorious and powerful the gospel is. And Paul is talking about how, how he is praying for the church of Romans, and it's, and it's all this encouraging stuff. It's talking about the gospel and how great the gospel is. I mean, what an introduction to this letter that Paul is writing. But today, as we start in verse 18, we're actually going to see Paul is going to shift what he is talking about from verse 18 all the way to chapter 3, verse 20. 
And this, and this thing that, that Paul is, is building up, this thing that Paul is going to be writing from that verse until chapter 3, verse 20, is that the wrath of God is against and revealed man's ungodliness and man's unrighteousness. And we are all guilty. Paul is, is going to be building up this case on the unrighteousness and the condemnation of man. We see the shift, verse 17, he says, the righteousness of God revealed, and then verse 18, now the wrath of God is revealed. And what we're going to see this morning, we're going to see that God's wrath is against sin. We're going to see God's general revelation that he gives to man through nature. And we're going to see man's rejection of that revelation given. Let's read verses 18 through 23 of Romans chapter 1. Verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, whom by their unrighteousness oppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, and the things that have been made. So, they are without excuse. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. God, thank you for your word. God, I pray and ask that you would help us in our worship this morning. God, would you lead me as I teach your word, God? God, would every single person in here understand your righteous wrath that you have against sin? Our, 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 our condemnation, our need of saving, and that Christ is that Savior. Well, would you lead us this morning? It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Our first point that we're going to be looking at is just in verse 18, and it's God's wrath against ungodliness and unrighteousness. God's wrath against ungodliness and unrighteousness. We see this in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And sometimes wrath can be a little awkward to talk about, it seems. Right? There's some that would shy away from talking about God's wrath, maybe saying, hey, you know, that's not too loving. We, we just need to talk about the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. And we 100% sh- we, we should talk about his love, his grace, and mercy. But if we don't understand God's wrath, we're not going to understand all of those other things. If we don't, don't understand God's wrath against unrighteousness and ungodliness, we're not going to understand the true depths of his grace towards us, his love, his mercy. So we must talk about God's wrath. And we're not going to skip over scripture. (laughs) Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. First thing we're going to see about God's wrath is that God's wrath is just. God's wrath if it's just, just a simple definition of, of wrath to understand it. Wrath is God's righteous anger towards sin. The most simple definition, God's righteous anger towards sin. And again, sometimes we, we cringe a little bit when we hear about God's wrath, but we, we, we must know God's wrath is just. God's wrath is not like our wrath. Right? God's wrath is not sinful. Right? Our, our wrath is, is full of anger and selfishness and tainted in sin, but not God's. But his wrath is just. Again, we talked about how God is loving, he's merciful, he's kind, he's patient. But he's also holy and righteous without sin. 
And so God must be wrathful towards sin if he is holy and righteous. He cannot be holy and righteous and just tolerate evil and tolerate wrong. But we see that his wrath is it's holy, it's righteous, and it's just. And we see that it's not random, it's not uncontrollable, it's not inconsistent. But Paul lays out what is, what is God's wrath towards? Man's ungodliness and man's unrighteousness. So what does he mean by ungodliness? It's a lack of devotion or worship to the true God. Right? God, God first commandment given in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not worship any other gods. He is God, and he demands worship, and man doesn't do it. So his wrath is against ungodliness, a lack of devotion to him because he is worthy of worship. And we see that God's wrath is also against unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is the result of ungodliness. If you don't worship God and and man doesn't devote himself to honoring God with his life, he's not going to do what God says to do. He's not going to care what God says to do. And godliness and unrighteousness. And notice that it says all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, not just some men, not just the really bad ones, not my neighbor who's way worse than me. No, all of men's unrighteousness and ungodliness. It says God's wrath is revealed from heaven against these sayings. What does Paul mean by this? Paul is saying that the wrath of God against sin, the the word revealed here is is to be something that is present and constant. It is constantly being revealed from where he sits in heaven. God is revealing constantly his wrath against ungodliness and unrighteousness. So So what does that mean? There's many different ways to to talk about God's wrath and and what he's talking about here. He's not saying that the wrath we see today is the same wrath that we'll see on Judgment Day that for for condemnation in hell. That's that's not the wrath that we see, but we see God's wrath is displayed in different ways. And it's always against ungodliness and unrighteousness. But but some examples of how, how God's wrath is revealed, we see it through the Bible. The flood. That was the wrath of God against ungodliness and unrighteousness. We look, we look at the Tower of Babel, and he spreads them all out. And that was his wrath against ungodliness and unrighteousness. We look at Sodom and Gomorrah. And that was God's wrath against ungodliness and unrighteousness, and we see it today. The Bible talks about how, how God gives people over to their sins, to go deeper and deeper and deeper into their sin. And and Danny's going to be covering that in verses 24 through 32 next week. But we see God's wrath in seeing that people get deeper in their sin. It's a part of his wrath, his judgment. He gives them over. All right, go ahead. We see it in our culture, around the world. People getting deeper and deeper and deeper in their ungodliness and unrighteousness. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against these things. We talk about God's wrath. We we sometimes might want to rationalize and say, you know, surely, surely people aren't that bad, though. Like really, God's wrath against unrighteousness and ungodliness against all men, all men are condemned. I mean, isn't that kind of harsh? What about, what about those who do not know God or, or those who have never heard of God? What about those who have never heard the gospel? Like, sh- surely they, they're okay. I think Paul was anticipating that argument, but Paul, remember what he's trying to do. He's trying to build a case for us to understand just how bad we are. God has generally revealed himself to man through nature. And man rejects 
and suppresses the truth of God. So the second point we're going to be looking at today is God's general revelation to man. So first he's established, look, God's wrath is against unrighteousness and ungodliness. He is a holy, righteous God. Sin will be paid for. And now we're going to see that all stand condemned. Verse 18, at the end it says that man suppresses the truth in his unrighteousness. So what truth is he suppressing? He's suppressing the knowledge of God. Right, this is a term called general revelation. General revelation. It's God's clear display of his glory and power in the works of creation and providence. It is God revealing himself to man. Let's look at verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. It's not knowledge of all about God, but, but, but God has revealed himself to man. It says that he has made it plain. He's made it clear so that all have seen that he is real. He has universally revealed himself to man. And then it tells us specifically in verse 20, it says, God reveals his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, and divine nature. They have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. God reveals to every man his eternal power and divine nature. Again, every man. Again, not everything, but his, we do see that he reveals his eternal power and divine nature. God reveals that he is an all-powerful creator that is divine, that is above every single man. We can look at nature and we can see that there is a divine creator. That there is someone who has made all of this. There is someone that is higher than us. And it's revealed through nature. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 2, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. We look at the stars, the many galaxies, the universe. And then we can bring it to a smaller scale. We just look at nature around us. We see that the seasons change in order for the crops to come. We see all of these things. We look at ourselves and we look at our DNA and how unique our DNA is and how specific it is to us and how if anything small was thrown off, everything would be thrown off. And it's all screaming as a witness that there is a creator God who is all-powerful and divine. The response that every single man, every single person should have is that there is a God. He's created this. He is above me, and I should seek after him to worship him. But we're going to see Paul lay out that this is never man's natural response. We already look back at verse 18. What does it say at the end of verse 18? Man suppresses the truth in his unrighteousness. Man in his natural sinful nature. We look at general revelation. We look at creation. We look at DNA. We look at all of these things and in our sinful nature we respond... No, I'm good. No, I don't care. No, I know that there's a creator, but I don't know. We'll get more into man's reaction and rejection here in a minute. But what Paul is building up here is what he says at the end of verse 20. He says, so they are 
without excuse. Every person has been revealed that there is a God of this world. And man rejects it. Paul is saying they are without excuse. Every man is guilty because every man rejects God in rebellion. The word without excuse, it carries this legal understanding of someone standing before a judge without defense. Guilty. And what this verse is saying is that all man left to himself is condemned. I've heard people uh, come to this conclusion that, that those who never hear the gospel, they go to heaven. And maybe you believe this, that, that you know, if, if, if it's not fair, if someone did not hear the gospel, they'll go to heaven because it was not fair that they did not hear the gospel. If that was the truth, it would be idiotic of us to even try to share the gospel with anybody. It would be idiotic for us to have any missionaries on the mission field trying to reach the, the thousands and thousands of unreached people groups. We need to pull them out. We need to stop giving the missions, and we need to make sure that we destroy anything that might have anybody accidentally read, hear, or see the gospel. But what does God's Word say? Man is without Excuse. Sometimes we might want to think that way because we have a high view of man and a low view of God. But we must take our view of man and our view of God from Scripture. And right here it says, that every man is without excuse and every man suppresses the truth in unrighteousness and every man is ungodly and does not care about God. Going back to missions, this verse like springs us forth to go and share the gospel and tell people, do you not realize that you are without excuse? And when I say low view of man, I'm not talking about we shouldn't value life. We shouldn't, va- we shouldn't value someone made in the image of God. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the, the reality that God is holy and righteous, a high view of God, that he is without sin. He is the God of all things, and he deserves all the glory, all the praise forever and ever. And the low view of man that we do not want to give him that. We don't care to give him that. That's what I mean by high view of God, low view of man. And Paul now, from verses 21 to 23, is now just going to be building that case even more about man's rejection of God's glory. That man does not care about the glory of God naturally in our own sin. So the third point, man's natural rejection of God's glory. Man's natural rejection of God's glory. We're going to see this in verses 21 through 23. Again, Paul is building this case about the condemnation of man, our guiltiness. We've already discussed in verse 18 that man already suppresses the truth in his unrighteousness. But now we're just going to work through verses 21 through 23 and see what else does man do. First, we see man does not glorify God. In our own sinful nature, we do not glorify God. Verse 21 For although they knew God, right, general revelation, we know that that God is real, God exists, we know that there is a God. 
Again, he, 19, he has made it plain to us. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Honor here can be, can be seen as, as glorify, right? We, we don't naturally glorify God. We don't naturally care to worship God. Like glorifying God is to exalt him and to re- recognize him for his supreme glory. But we do not do that naturally. The Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, what is the chief end of man? It says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And John MacArthur points out, failing to give God glory is man's greatest affront to his creator. Man does not glorify God. Next, we see man does not give thanks to God. Man does not, we, we do not naturally give thanks to God. Verse 21, it says we do not honor him or give thanks to him. Man can see all of God's common mercies, but do not care to give thanks to him. Matthew 5, 45, it says, For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Acts 14, 17, it says, Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with the, good, with the food and gladness. All good things come down from God. But us in our natural, again, I'm saying our natural, our born state of being sinners, we do not give him thanks. We don't care to rejoice and worship him. Why give him thanks? See, man does not give thanks to God. Third, man's thinking is futile. Man's thinking is futile. Verse 21 again. But they became futile in their thinking. Since man suppresses the truth of God, Since man doesn't want to glorify God, since man does not want to give thanks to God of all the things that he has given us, we must turn to our own wisdom to answer for for life, for purpose. And we see that our sin leads us to, to, to worthless thinking. This leads to the thoughts of man to be futile worthless in its own corruption. We see this in science. And one of the biggest things, the Big Bang Theory. Right? We look at the, at, the, at the universe and the world and we have to see that there is a creator, there is an author. It's not chaos. But if man is to reject God and not care about God and suppress the truth of him, they must have an answer for, for the creation. And please hear me on, I'm not against science. I don't want us to think that I'm all for science when it's done correctly. Because we should be scared of science as believers because all science does is prove that our God is real. So don't, don't be scared of science, but it must be done correctly. We see man's thinking is futile. Next, we see man's heart is darkened. In our sin, our hearts are darkened. And their foolish hearts were darkened, it says. Constant rejection of God and rebellion against Him does not lead to some greater enlightenment of truth. But it leads us to deeper and deeper and deeper sin. To a darker heart that loves the darkness and hates the light more and more. We see Jesus talk about this in John 3. John 3, 19, it says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, being Christ, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. We hate the light in our sin. Man's heart is darkened. Next, we see man's arrogance shows his foolishness. 
man's arrogance show shows his foolishness. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Again, if we reject God, we suppress the truth, we have to come up with our own answers, don't we? What is the purpose of this life? What, what is the meaning of this life? Where does life come from? Wisdom of this age says that there is no God except you. Therefore, live your life as your own God. The wisdom of this age says that truth is subjective, so you need to just live out your own truth and I'll live out my own truth. Wisdom of this age says that there is only one life, so you better live it up. Do what you want to do. Say what you want to say. Be with whoever you want to be with and just do you because you only got one chance. And it's in these very claims of wisdom that we see that man is foolish. And lastly, we see man worships creation over creator. Man worships creation over creator. Verse 23. It says a man has exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Man's natural response to God is to look at him and see that he is immortal and say, I want to worship something in my own image. There are considered to be thousands of religions in the world. We look at Hinduism, for example. They have around or over 33 million gods that they worship. We see in ancient cultures, even today, many of the religions of all time have worshipped birds and animals and, and creeping things. I mean, we even see the Israelites make the golden calf. As Moses is on the mountain. <laughs> but even if someone says, I'm not a religious person, I don't, I don't really worship a God, I don't align myself with a religion, they still worship something. And this something is what all man naturally worships. Every single one of us in our sin naturally worships this one thing. Ourselves. We, in our own natural sin, we want to be God. Why give, why give glory to this immortal God when I can give glory to myself? This passage has been so humbling to me. Danny says this often. If he was a topical preacher, he wouldn't choose so-and-so passage. If I was a topical preacher, I probably wouldn't choose the passage that constantly talks about how awful we are. Actually, you know what? I probably would because we need to know how bad we are to see how good God is. In all this, we see that God, who is holy, he is righteous. He has a righteous wrath towards man. Right, we, we, we suppress the truth in our unrighteousness. We, we dishonor God. We do not give Him thanks. Our, our thinking is futile. We're foolish. We worship ultimately ourselves and we have darkened hearts on our own. We stand fully condemned to God. Without excuse. That is the bad news. And that bad news, we should tell to all people. But it should never be shared alone. It should never be shared without being accompanied by the good news of the gospel. Amen. Imagine if I just said, all right, man worships creation over creator. We're in sin. We can't do anything. Let's pray. Probably be a really sad service, right? 
but we must look to the good news of the gospel. But to understand the good news, we have to understand the bad. We have to see our need for Christ, for a Redeemer, for a Savior. As general revelation reveals God's divine nature, we see that God has a specific revelation that is revealed through the Word of God and the Word that became flesh, Christ. This revelation that, that though man is guilty in sin, the Son of God became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived a life that was not filled with ungodliness and unrighteousness, but He lived a perfect life of godliness and righteousness on our behalf. The very one that says we cannot live that way, Christ has done it. The wrath of God that we have talked about, Christ has bore on Himself on the cross. For all those who believe. And the good news that Christ did not remain dead. We don't worship a dead guy. We worship the risen, shining Son, King Jesus. And it's that we can go from being condemned, dead in our sins, Children of wrath. That's not words I've made up. That is what Scripture describes us as. To becoming a child of God. Through faith and repentance in Christ. That's, that, this, is, this is building up. right? Paul's building this, this, this discussion up, this, this argument up. So then when we get to Romans 8.1, we, we shout joyfully, Amen. Because in Romans 8.1 it says, There is therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. This should lead us to a greater understanding and appreciation of God's grace. Again, this passage has humbled me this week. Because as I'm reading it, I'm saying, that's me. God, I suppressed your truth and unrighteousness. I didn't care about you. God, I rejected you. I wanted to worship myself. God, in his grace and his mercy and his love, has redeemed me through Christ. If he has done that for you, rejoice. We must, we must look at passages like this as believers as a reminder of God's goodness and his grace. Let us rejoice daily in Christ, our King that has died to save His unrighteous and ungodly bride. And through His blood, He has made us righteous. If you're here today and you have not put your faith in Christ, please see the warning that says, no one is without excuse. I pray that you would see your sin and unrighteousness against a holy God that we just sang about earlier. And then you would see Christ as glorious. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for this reminder of just how bad we are. I pray that this would remind us of how good you are. That you have sent your son, Christ Jesus, to live the life we could not live, to die the death we deserve, and raise again victoriously from the grave. God, would you remind us of the victory that we have in Christ? And God, I pray for anyone in here who has not put their faith in Christ as their Savior, as Lord. God, would you lead them to do so today? Would you help them see Christ as victorious? As you say in 2 Corinthians 4, that you would shine the light out of the darkness of their hearts. 
and you would shine the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. And let us give you all the glory and the praise forever and ever.